This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources. Consistent with its running right process, Alpha is an energy company committed to being a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. We fuel progress around the world. More information at alphanr.com. Haley Buick GMC. The place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. On Midlothian Turnpike in Richmond and online at haleybuickgmc.com. Taking it to the streets and helping our community. Intelligent Illuminations. We make street lights smart and give you control, providing secure point-to-point -point wireless solutions for roadway and area lighting, helping you manage, monitor, and control your street lights. More information at ilooms.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at vachamber.com. I just received a letter from a student who thanked me for instilling the love of math in him. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond and a welcome to Senator Mark Obenchain. Appreciate your being on and helping our viewers know what's happening around the state. You, you like most of your colleagues, do a great job of communicating with your constituents, but we want people around the, the state to hear about some major issues you've been working on. And let's, let's start with charter schools. Well, thank you. First of all, thanks for having me and appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about some of these issues. Uh, charter schools is uh, an issue that is familiar to people in uh, a lot of corners of the country, but not so much in Virginia. Right. Uh, they have uh, been tremendously successful in Republican states, Democrat states, uh, purple states, and uh, they have really provided a much needed alternative, especially in school divisions that have stagnated or are failing. And uh, our law in Virginia is uh, such that we really have discouraged anybody from even applying to open a charter school here. Uh, something like 40% of the kids being educated in Washington, D.C. go to charter schools. In Virginia, we have six charter schools in the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, I really think that uh, we need to do more to make sure that kids aren't left behind. We have great school divisions in most of the state, but we have a handful of school divisions in corners of Virginia where we are just failing our kids. And it's just fundamentally unjust for us to uh, provide a world-class education uh, in certain zip codes and then a third world education in other zip codes. And charter schools represent a great opportunity. We have a constitutional amendment that's moving through and unfortunately amending the Constitution is the only way we can fix this problem in Virginia and uh, allow more charters to be developed and for the first time ever uh, the constitutional amendment has cleared the Senate and uh, I, I hope that uh, by the end of this week, the House will have approved it. Doesn't even have to go to the governor. If it passes two years, uh, it's up to the people to decide whether you know, we jumpstart the charter school movement here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Well, in your, in your work of co-chairing the Senate Courts Committee, you've, you've been dealing with some major issues in that committee, and, and some of them your own issues, uh, sex trafficking, DNA issues, uh, Tell us about those. Well, sure, and uh, for my 12 years that I've been here in the General Assembly, I've really tried to focus on 
the basics, the fundamental responsibilities of government. And for me, it's education, it's public safety, it's transportation. And we've talked a little bit about education, but on the public safety front, you know, we, uh, we, it is the ultimate free market. I mean, we have got, we'll never get ahead of criminal enterprises. Uh, they are always looking for new angles and new ways to make money. And uh, really, the new front for organized crime and, frankly, for child predators is uh, sex trafficking. Uh, sex trafficking, particularly of children, is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. And some estimates say that there are 300,000 kids uh, in America who are being sold for sex. And uh, what gangs and organized crime are finding is that they can make more money on uh, sex trafficking of children than they can on selling drugs. And the average age of these kids is, is 12 years old. Uh, 13, excuse me, which means that there are an awful lot of 11 and 12 year olds out there. And it's happening here in Virginia. Washingtonian Magazine just did a uh, story about a year ago, uh, cover story on sex trafficking in the D.C. suburbs around Dulles and elsewhere. And we really need to make sure that we are giving law enforcement the tools that they need in order to protect our kids because they're being recruited in high schools and middle schools and malls and online. And we need to uh, really step up our enforcement effort and protect our children. So, so the, the effort successful this year? Uh, it looks like it. We are in the final stages. Uh, it looks like Virginia uh, will now have a standalone felony for sex trafficking and join the majority of states across the country in providing this tool to uh, law enforcement. And you also asked about DNA testing. Yeah. And uh, we have long uh, been using DNA for criminal justice purposes and you know, it does a great job of solving crimes. It also is an important tool in exonerating the innocent uh, and preventing the, those from being wrongly accused and in freeing uh, some who've been convicted of crimes that they did not commit. And uh, we uh, uh, already require convicted felons to uh, provide DNA samples, and a handful of uh, misdemeanors uh, are required upon conviction to give DNA samples. Uh, this year, we just had a high-profile uh, murder in Charlottesville, the Hannah Graham case. And uh, it turns out that the man who stands accused of her murder uh, was somebody who was I uh, was uh, apparently involved in a sexual assault in which there was DNA left under his victim's fingernails and uh, he was subsequently uh, convicted of a misdemeanor that may have, may have, could have required his giving DNA. And if he had given DNA uh, following that misdemeanor conviction, uh, Hannah Graham may never have met uh, her accused killer and she'd be where she ought to be, studying for final exams right about now. So we have, uh, I've crafted a bill along with Delegate Bell in the House of Delegates to expand the uh, categories of crimes for which DNA testing is going to be required. And uh, we have uh, very carefully worked with the Crime Commission to look at the crimes that are most likely to lead to the commission of violent felonies later. And this is going to be an important tool, not only in solving crimes, but in preventing crimes like uh, these, this terrible murder in Charlottesville. Has that been an issue that uh, there's been acceptance of along the way, or have you had to, to fight to get that one through? Uh, you know, we have worked hard to make sure that we got it right. And, uh, um, you know, I'm most concerned about trying to make sure that we respect civil, liberty, civil liberties, uh, that we are protecting the innocent and uh, also protecting victims. And uh, I think that we have a strong consensus in both chambers that if we limit this to crimes that do lead to uh, yeah. uh, violent felonies and if we do uh, take the DNA only after conviction that we are protecting the rights of people we ought to be protecting. 
Yeah, what about some other issues? Anything else pertaining to the Internet that, that you've been working on? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, there are. And a couple of things, real quickly, uh, you know, Virginia is, uh, uh, like the rest of the country, involved in uh, technology and right. technological industries that most of us wouldn't have dreamed of years ago. Uh, Uber and Lyft, uh, the uh, transportation networking uh, companies that are exploding in popularity, have come to Virginia and they uh, had no operating authority here in the Commonwealth and uh, I carried legislation earlier this year that was rolled into legislation that passed that provided the operation uh, authority for these companies to come in and provide competition to uh, those who are providing transportation services in Virginia. I think it's good for, uh, good for consumers, good for business, good for entrepreneurs. Uh, also, you know, we all have internet accounts, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, Facebook accounts, Twitter accounts, or, you know, email accounts with Gmail or uh, Yahoo or whatever other service. And uh, the interesting question has arisen over the past few years, what happens to those accounts after we die? And uh, there's been litigation over that, and we don't have a very good answer. Federal law uh, gives us the ability here at the state level to set up rules that govern that. But in Virginia, we really have no rules. And when you die, mm. your online presence evaporates. And uh, I carried legislation this year that does provide an avenue for executors and administrators and family members to make sure that uh, that the privacy of the account holder is respected, but also to provide the account holder with an opportunity to give their family access to uh, those online accounts if they want to. So that's, uh, uh, you know, it is, an, it is a new world out there, and this is one of the new issues that we're having to grapple with and figure out how to accommodate. Oh, that, that is certainly a, a most intriguing one. Because I will say that occasionally when I've seen a death of someone, their, their account was still active and, and you don't know, you know what's going to happen to it. Well, that's right. And, uh, you know, it raises all kinds of interesting issues, uh, and uh, uh, some of which involve the privacy of the account holder. Right. I mean, heck, it used to be that if uh, somebody had a paramour on the side and had a package of love letters, they could burn them. Uh, and at their uh, impending death. You can't do that with online accounts. And what do you do to protect the privacy if somebody has set mm -hmm. up an account that they never intended for another living soul to see? And it may be painful for a family. So, you know, we, we want to provide right. family with access to you know, those accounts that they ought to have access to. And my legislation allows them to uh, mm -hmm. declare in powers of attorney or in their will uh, that they want uh, their executors and family members to have access to it, and uh, it's, uh, it is an interesting issue. We're, time's about up, but is there something else you want to tell the viewers, maybe something you're working on for the next session? Well, you know, we are working hard to make sure that these priorities are, uh, are remain our priorities. I've always felt that we really do need to look at the basics, the responsibilities of government, the things that we think are most foundational, uh, education, transportation, public safety. My view is if we're not doing those things well, government doesn't have any business sticking its fingers into a lot of the other things, nice as they may be, uh, that we stick our fingers into every year. So I plan to continue to work on those priorities. Uh, work will never be done. I certainly will be done at some point, but it has been a great pleasure and honor to represent the people of the Shenandoah Valley and General Assembly of Virginia. Senator Overjane, thank you so much for being on This Week in Richmond. Appreciate this report. Uh, your constituents knew, but now folks around the Commonwealth will know. And, and thank you for your service and for your leadership. Well, thanks for having me.
like to welcome Senator Frank Wagner to This Week in Richmond. Glad to have you back on. We're having the conversation, we can tell folks, on day 45 of the session. We were just saying we don't know what time today the session will end, but it looks like it is going to end a day early this year. It, it will, David. Yes. That's a, that's a good thing. That's yes. a good thing. Yes. So I think everybody's ready to go home, particularly this winter with the Oh. With the snow and the ice yes. we've had, and uh, uh, apparently I'm going home to Virginia Beach where you don't expect a whole lot of snow to about 10 or 12 inches of snow. So, so it should be interesting on the, on the trip home tomorrow. Well, uh, another week or so when folks are seeing this show, maybe they'll be saying, well, it's, it's warm now, so we, we, can, hope, we can hope. We can <laughs> I hope. certainly hope so. We can I hope. certainly hope so. Appreciate your being on, and the governor has already signed a premier bill that you carried that uh, had a lot of discussion. So help, help our viewers around the Commonwealth better understand what all is involved in that so-called Dominion Power Bill, although it affected more than just Dominion. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and let me start with the premise, first of all, that we, ha we pay the lowest electric rates of any state in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, we have some of the most competitive electric rates in the nation. Start with that premise, which is right. which is true, yes. and then go and understand that last summer EPA put out a set of regulations that would require Virginia to ratchet down on carbon output for electric generation down to a number that would be exactly half of what West Virginia is being required to ratchet down to, significantly less than what Maryland would be required to ratchet down to. Kentucky's carbon output would be even higher than West Virginia, so Virginia was being punished or the proposed regulations, which I suspect will be final next summer, Virginia's being punished because we're already a low-carbon producing state. In other words, we have a balance of about a third nuclear, about a third natural gas, and about a third coal. And the EPA is trying to ratchet down even further, and they're doing it by state, so they have punished Virginia. And, and I could go mm. through the nuances, but they right. didn't look back far enough, that, and our nuclear power plants didn't get counted, and all of those type, or got counted very little. And all of those things mean that Virginia, Virginia was on the road to having to shut four out of five coal plants. Now, that's the premise. We had a committee meeting, joint committee meeting of Commerce and Labor, and then the uh, chairman of Commerce and Labor in the Senate assigned me as a subcommittee chairman over the intervening. This started in October. So we met throughout November and December to formulate some type of strategy for Virginia to uh, move forward with to, to try to, to compensate for these very, very harsh regulations. We heard from the State Corporation Commission, and, and this is the State Corporation Commission that regulates the electric, uh, electric companies, that, that they considered these rules arbitrary, capricious, and unlawful. That's the proposed EPA rules, and that's very, very strong language for a lawyer to use. They also said in testimony that at the minimum rates would increase by 22 percent because of these new regulations. And the reason why is when you have to shutter four out of five coal plants prematurely, you have what's called stranded costs. And it's all these costs. You might, the coal plant might have another 25 or 30 years yes, of life expectancy. Right. Mm -hmm. You're forced to shut it down early. Those costs were going to be amortized over the next 25 or 30 years. They're not. Instantly, the ratepayers have to capture that. And then, of course, you have to replace that coal generation with something. And, and that would probably be natural gas, and that the ratepayers would have to pay for that new billion dollar plus plant to replace the coal plant that was shut down for no reason other than the EPA said shut it down. That's the situation we found ourselves in. What was even more disturbing in my mind was 12 states have filed lawsuits against the EPA for these regulations. Unfortunately, and, and I can't figure out why the Attorney General has not, but he did chose not to file a lawsuit to protect Virginia's consumers. That also was going on at the same time we're looking at this. So we felt like in the General Assembly we had to do something to protect the consumers of Virginia during a session. We're only here for 45 days. The Attorney General chose to do nothing. Um, these regulations are marching forward, so what could we do? Well, knowing, and go back to what I started with, we have the lowest rates of any mid-Atlantic state. Why don't we freeze these rates for a period of five years? We've done this before. When we went down the road of deregulation, we actually froze rates for seven years back in, I think, of 2003 mm -hmm. or 2002 to 2009. Mm -hmm. We froze those rates. And, and so we chose to say, okay, look, why don't we do a rate freeze now? And let's give direction, regardless of what goes on in Washington, because certainly after these regulations become final, there will be lawsuits, and mm -hmm. ultimately the, everybody's nodding and saying the Supreme Court will decide what we have to do in Virginia. Ultimately, this will go to the Supreme Court. So in that intervening time, while the regulations become final, Virginia develops a plan to comply, hopefully Virginia joins a lawsuit, 
but the suits are filed and they wind their way through the courts. Let's not do anything. Let's freeze our rates. Let's keep every coal plant open, okay, unless the, the utility has to come back to SEC, which is a whole change. It's a new authority for SEC if they want to shut our coal plant. Let's keep all the coal plants open and let's lock in rates. And originally, eight years, and I suspect I had to negotiate back to five as it went through the legislative process, but I suspect we'll come back to regret that we didn't freeze rates for eight years. But we've frozen rates for five years. We've frozen these lowest rates of any mm -hmm. mid-Atlantic state. Um, we go through, and now there's been some solar added to, to um, uh, and four or five hundred megawatts of solar will be built, and I think that was planned anyway, and it just gives a degree of formality that was an amendment I put in and, and a number of other things. But the, but the capsulation of this is this. And, and, you know, the media tries to spin this as, oh, this is Dominion, this is Dominion, you know, gee, the SEC, they're going to make a lot of money. What the viewers need to know is that Chaparral Steel, the largest user of electricity in Virginia, the largest electric meter of anyone, supported the bill. The Chamber of Commerce, which represents every business, supported the bill. Uh, Mead West Vaco, a huge consumer of electricity in Virginia, supported the bill. The NAACP, who, who you know, looks after yes, the, their community, right. supported the bill. Those that represent folks on fixed incomes who could ill afford electric rate increase supported the bill. It has broad support, which the media is never told. You know, they're trying to imply or spin this like somehow this is great for Dominion. Very interesting, since the bill passed, Dominion stock has gone down almost 10 percent. So, so I, you know, if the media thinks that this is going on, I would suggest to the media that Wall Street thinks a little different. Um, but I'm not going to get into that debate. Right, right. Why did all these folks support it? Because the one thing you hear that everybody wants is stability. Just give me certainty. Business wants certainty. Consumers want certainty. Mm -hmm. People on fixed incomes want certainty. They can accommodate their electric bill today, and they'd like to be able to know they can accommodate it five years from now, and that these costs don't grow, and they have to make decisions between do they want medicine or pay their electric bill, or do they want food or pay their electric bill. These are real decisions that Virginians make every day, and, and we need to, to ensure that there's that degree of stability. And what I hear from businesses, and I'm a businessman when I'm not up here, is give me stability. Give me certainty out sure. of Washington. Yeah. And unfortunately, Washington gives you anything but stability right now. So this was our opportunity to provide stability to ratepayers. I think that's why it had such a broad spectrum of support, not just from the generators, but from the consumers of electricity. And, and so, you know, uh, I think that's why it enjoyed broad bipartisan support. And why the governor signed it. Right. And, and, and if, if the viewers didn't catch it, it, it didn't pass unanimously, but the, the margin was overwhelming in both chambers. Overwhelming, veto-proof, uh, yes. overwhelming majorities. Right. And, and you're always going to have a few, and I suspect that they are more aligned with some of the fringe environmental groups than, than the mainstream uh, of that. And they're probably very reflective of their districts. They tend to be extremely liberal uh, or progressive, whatever word you want to use, districts uh, up in Northern Virginia. Well, that, that has certainly been a, a session that, that occupied much of your time, and we have another couple of minutes. You chaired Rehab and Social Services Committee in addition to that, and then other, <laughs> other, other efforts, any, anything else you well, like to I, I think Well, I think in Rehab and Social Services, probably the, the uh, uh, well, t two major uh, uh, issues roll through there. One is uh, uh, daycare regulations, of which mm -hmm. the, the compromise has finally been hashed out, and so... So uh, that came out of our committee in response to a number of very tragic events that we've seen in daycare right. centers. There's been a significant revamping of, of ABC, which will be ongoing. Uh, that the, the alcohol beverage control falls under the purview of rehab and social services. Right. And, and uh, there's been a revamping and a reorganization of, of ABC that, uh, that uh, we think will actually make ABC operate more like a business. And, and we think that's a good thing. Uh, uh, the state, the taxpayers, uh, derive a nice profit off of ABC that goes into our schools, goes into public safety, goes into to, to all the programs that we fund, and it doesn't cost the taxpayers money. Uh, it is the, the profit made by ABC that rolls back into to, to the general fund, and so so I think that's a positive thing. I'm also on the finance committee, and, and obviously yes, the budget uh, takes right. up a large amount of time, right. uh, and I chair the transportation subcommittee 
of the Finance Committee, and there's been a significant uh, rewrite of how we're going to do, uh, how we're going to fund roads, and, and not a funding bill. That was two years ago. That was that uh, was in the uh, uh, 20th House Bill 2313, and now famous funding bill. This is a reorganization of how we're going to apply those funds and what are they going to be applied to. And I think in the end, uh, we'll have a lot more certainty. It used to be the six-year plan was kind of like a, a hopeful wish list, mm -hmm. but not necessarily a plan. Now, by putting more of the dollars down in the district engineer's hands, we can see one go through engineering design and then actually get built, as opposed to many of the projects we saw go through engineering design and then never get funded to the build side. And, and a lot more focus on, on, on the rebuilding of highways and rebuilding of bridges. We have some critical infrastructure needs with our existing roads and bridges that we need a focus of more of those transportation dollars. And then we had a big problem uh, we were facing in terms of what we called a cliff on, on, on mass transit funding, where we had to do some reorganization of dollars to ensure that the mass transit systems, not just the big city mass transit, but some of the smaller transit systems and some of the smaller cities around Virginia um, get the funding they need to continue to operate and be able to buy the equipment they need to, to, to be able to run the mass transit system. So yeah, a, lot of, a lot of moving parts on busy. smaller yes. bills, and, and, uh, but it's been a, been a great session, been, been oh, really very busy. But Time's out, but we look forward, when you're back in the summer, we look forward to having another conversation with Absolutely, you. Absolutely, David. Yeah. I'd, be, yeah. I'd, be, yeah, I'd love to have it. Thank you very much. Thanks. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. Haley Buick GMC, in Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. Intelligent Illuminations, helping you manage, monitor, and control your streetlights. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.